characters who are, who are going to tell us about some cool stuff. Um, before we get started, I want to make a quick announcement uh, about the open problem session tomorrow. Um, so if you look on the schedule, it says like the last thing tomorrow is uh, open problems and happy hour. Um, so what's going to happen is we'll have another one of these speed talk things. And then after that, we'll all migrate up to the second floor where there will be food and beverages and whiteboards. And uh, I think we're going to try to pre-populate the whiteboards with some of the open questions that you all have been writing on the Zulip forum. So now is the time to put an open question there if uh, if you have one in mind and you haven't, um, because then we'll we'll pick some. And, and you can vote on them also, just like add emojis or something. And we'll, we'll, we'll take the most some of the most popular ones and put them up on whiteboards. And then folks can kind of cluster around and I don't know, either solve all of them or at least form some collaborations and start ch ch chatting. Um, but so this is just an announcement telling you, uh, if you haven't already started thinking about open problems that you might want to post on the Zulip, uh, now, now's a good time. All right, so without further ado, let's get on to the speed talks. Our uh, first speaker is Ray Lee from Santa Clara University. Uh, Ray, take it away. Thanks. So I'll be talking about deletion codes and LCS, and this is based on joint works with uh, Venkat and Chai. Oops. So I'll be telling you two stories about deletion codes and longest common subsequences. So the first one is about deletion codes. So I'm going to start with a combinatorics question, and if, you, if you've seen this before, don't say anything. So we're going to start with a warm-up question, which I promise you is easy. What is the largest set of binary strings we can find such that the LCS between any two is at most n over two? So we want a large set of binary strings such that you know, any two are far apart and that they have small longest common subsequence. Okay. So uh, any guesses? Just speak up if you, if you have the answer. Two? It is two, yes. Uh, so the answer is two. You can take the all zero string and the all one string and um, these have LCS zero, so it certainly satisfies the uh, requirements. Uh, and if you have three strings, then there are two strings with, say, at least as many uh, ones as zeros, um, or the same majority bit, so their LCS is n over two. So you notice here that L I didn't say this LCS is um, uh, not necessarily consecutive. Um, okay. So this is a simple question. Um, so now let's uh, relax this a bit, right? This is a very simple question, simple solution. OK, now let's say we want LCS, pairwise LCS, you know, n over 2 plus epsilon n for some absolute epsilon. Okay. So this is a, you know, e, like a relaxation. So it's a relaxed constraint. So potentially, we could find more strings. So now the question is, how many strings can we find? So this turns out to be quite a difficult question. So before our work, uh, there was a double exponential gap between the best upper and lower bounds. The best uh, construction had you know, roughly log n strings, and it's given you know, something, it looks something like what I've shown on the right. And uh, the best upper bound was not much better than the, um, you know, tr the trivial you know, 2 to the n exponential type bound. Okay, so you can improve the constant in the exponent, but it's um, double exponential gap. And the main contribution of our work was to improve the upper bound from exponential type to quasi-polynomial type. So to be precise about the quantifiers, we show that in any set of binary strings that is sufficiently large quasi-polynomial size, there are two strings with LCS n over 2 plus um, epsilon n for some absolute constant epsilon. Okay, so this is a combinatorics result, uh, but it also has a deletion codes interpretation. Um, so the statement is that there are no asymptotically positive rate error correcting codes correcting this 0.5 minus some delta fraction of worst case deletion. So this is, again, the combinatorics result. And how do you translate this combinatorics thing into the deletion codes thing? Well, C, as the notation might suggest, is an error correcting code. And this is saying for any error correcting code that um, is this size, so this includes all positive rate codes. Uh, for any positive rate code, we have this condition, which um, is equivalent to saying that it doesn't correct um, that many worst case deletions. Okay. This is some result about, you know, there are no positive rate error correcting codes correcting this fraction of worst case deletions. Okay, so this is some fundamental result about deletion codes. So maybe I'll spend just one more slide explaining what this is, okay, or wh why this is fundamental. Okay, so uh, insertion deletion error correcting codes were uh, uh, originally uh, studied by Levenstein and Ullman, and um, there's this you know classic result that says a code correcting deletion a code corrects p n worst case deletions if any two strings have pairwise small LCS um, uh, pairwise LCS less than n minus p times n. 
Okay. So we've got you know our definition of a noise model, and you know in coding theory we often measure some uh, how good a code is by the rate. So you can ask you know what is the optimal trade-off between the rate and the noise tolerance, right? We ask this in all kinds of contexts in coding theory. Let's ask this for deletions, which is this very you know mathematically fundamental model. Okay. So this is an open question. I've kind of sketched you know very sketchily you know what is the best trade-off between R and P, but this is open. Okay, so maybe this is this is open, but maybe that's not so embarrassing because we know even for erasures and substitutions, this is still open, right? There's the GV bound and these linear programming bounds, right? So we don't know it even for substitutions, uh, but it is our the the state of affairs is uh, somewhat embarrassing. We don't even know what is uh, for what values of p can we have r bigger than zero. So um, we don't know for what values of p can we have asymptotically positive rate codes. So you can imagine this, this big open question is asking about this, this curve of optimal, uh, uh, this trade-off curve of R versus P values. And this open and embarrassing question is just asking about what is the P intercept of this curve. So it's just asking for you know, one point on this curve. And you know, by contrast, you know, this has been known for substitutions and erasures since at least, at least since 1960, maybe earlier. Um, this is the Plotkin bound that will show that you know, for substitution, you can't do better than a quarter and erasures is like a half. Um, so this is like easy, not too hard to prove for substitution and erasures, but for deletions, it's still open. Okay. So for deletions, there's this a simple argument that you can't do correct better than a half fraction of deletions, right? This is actually equivalent to the combinatorics, uh, easy combinatorics question I showed you on the first slide. So you can't do better than a half, and um, so there was this you know extra embarrassing question of. Could you have codes that uh, are positive rate and correct all the way up to a half? So for some half minus epsilon, could you have positive rate codes? And we didn't know whether you could rule out this or find a code, right? And the contribution of our work was to at least resolve this embarrassment and to say, you know, no, you actually can't get all the way to a half. There's some for some absolute, you know, epsilon, you can't correct half minus epsilon fraction of deletions. This is still compatible with your number. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's the same. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> All right. So that's the first story I want to tell. And um, so I was giving a talk on on this on on this um, on this result. And uh, Said said again, who works in algorithms, was in the audience, and he mentioned that there is this uh, related problem on um, approximation algorithms for LCS. And it turns out that they're superficially similar, but actually, you know, we, we're able to use techniques from this to solve this other problem. So even though this is a coding theory session, I'll tell you about application of these techniques and algorithms. Okay. So, um, so you all know from algorithms that uh, you know you can compute the LCS of two strings in O of n squared time using dynamic programming if they're length n, and um, you could ask, are there faster algorithms? And there's all these results in fine-grained complexity that says, well, you can do a little bit better, but uh, if you want to do you know, truly subquadratic time, you can't do this assuming you know, um, you know, plausible fine-grained complexity hypotheses. Okay. So you can't do better than um, quadratic time, substantially better than quadratic time. So you could ask, well, can you get faster approximation algorithms? And if you are doing LCS for two binary strings, there is a simple one-half approximation in uh, linear time. You just count the number of zeros and ones, and um, you can prove this in one line that this does the right thing. Okay. So there's a simple half approximation. So you could naturally ask, can you get a half plus epsilon approximation? Um, and so it was known uh, by Rubinstein and Song, you could do this if the strings are the same length. But uh, somehow this really crucially used that the strings are the same length. And uh, using some ideas from the deletion codes work, we were able to show you can actually do this even if the strings are unequal length. Okay. And sort of the, 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 the main uh, exciting part is that we use the same techniques as we do in the deletion codes bound. So it kind of builds this bridge between the coding question and this algorithmic question. Okay. So now I'll say a little bit more about what's the connection here. So you notice the first, the, the algorithmic result is a, you know, this, we're getting a half plus epsilon approximation of binary longest common subsequence. This other thing is um, some combinatorics result about longest common subsequence. And the combinatorics result, it's a negative result about deletion codes. And this is a positive algorithmic result. So how could they be similar? But if you think about the deletion codes result, it's actually more of a positive result in the algorithmic sense because you are showing, like you look at the quantifiers, there exists like this long common subsequence in these two strings. So it's kind of a positive result in the algorithmic sense. So um, you might suspect there's something um, in common. 
And they have this theme of they're both breaking this trivial one half barrier. Like there's this, you know, getting one half is trivial, and then but getting half plus epsilon is somehow very difficult. Um, so for both of these, we break this trivial one half barrier, uh, and we do it with similar ideas. Um, and since it's a 10 minute talk, I don't have to say anything about the, or I don't have to go into detail about the techniques because it's very annoying or very technical. Um, but uh, the highest level ideas, we come up with this uh, thing that's roughly analogous to a Fourier transform for strings. So it's a structure lemma that classifies strings by the, this oscillation frequency. And um, if you want to know more about this, I can chat off. Okay. Uh, and so there's a bunch of open questions here, both for like appro the approximation algorithms and for the deletion codes. There's a lot more that aren't on this slide and I'm um, happy to chat about any of these, but uh, that's all. We have time for one quick question while the next speaker sets up. So is this connection between code and algorithm? Like, does it depend on the, the specific epsilon that you have, or is it something more general? Uh, is the connection between codes and algorithms? Like the epsilon that you have from the negative result? Ah, it's, it's a slightly different epsilon, but I think that's more of just like when we do these different, when we do the connection, we don't, it's kind of lossy, but. Uh, if you improve the codes, then you improve the, the approximation algorithm or not? Yes, but uh, I think it'll still be bad unless you really refine the algorithm. Well, let's thank Ray again. And uh, next up, we have uh, Krishna Narayanan from Texas A&M. Got the mic all working. Can you hear me? Great. Yeah, thank you, Mary. All right, so I am interested in understanding how list recoverable codes may be of use for some multiple access problems that I've been thinking about in wireless networks. So I'm going to spend most of this time trying to describe the context and the problem and maybe pose a few questions. So the problem we've been interested in is uh, you have a wireless network. You have a large number of users in a network, but only a small set of them are active at any given time. So let's say we have K users in a network who are active. Each one of them has a B bit message that they want to send. And typically what happens is that they encode this message using an error correcting code. And let's say that for the purposes of this talk that this is a code over FQ. And so I'm going to use C sub IJ to refer to the ith symbol in the code word of the jth user. And then usually what happens is these symbols get mapped to real or complex vectors and they are actually transmitted through the channel. Now this is where all the algebraic structure of the code gets destroyed. So I am not going to worry too much about what happens underneath this and I'm going to try to explain the coding problem that may be relevant. So a lot happens here. We don't need to care too much about this, but in the end, we're going to abstract this into saying what the receiver gets to see is the set of symbols that were transmitted by the J users at each time instant. So there are two versions of this problem. In one version, you get to observe the set, but you don't get to see the multiplicity of the symbols. If two people were to pick the same symbol at the same time and transmit, you know that the symbol was transmitted. You don't really know how many people transmitted it. And in the other version, you get to see the multiplicities as well. So you know exactly what symbols were transmitted and how many such of them were transmitted. And your job, of course, is to find which code words were transmitted by the users. So you can already see this looks very much like a list recoverable code type uh, set, setup. Uh, in the communication theory area, this was first, the, the problem was described in 1981 by, by uh, Chang and Wolf, and there were some information theoretic results and even some code constructions for this. But the thing that's different now is that when you typically do information theoretic proofs in these multi-user situations, you inherently somehow assume that these codes are all different. Like if you go to the standard proofs of achieving capacity on the multi-user channels, these codes are typically different. And in practice, the way this might work is that your base station will have to tell each person to pick some parameters in the code that are somehow different. Now, recently, there is a lot of interest 
in trying to do away with this paradigm. I mean, the problem with the base station telling people what code to pick is that there is overhead and there is, we want to get rid of this overhead. So we want to go to a paradigm where we say, we're going to force every user to pick exactly the same code. So I have K users, B bits, they're all going to pick exactly the same code. They're going to transmit. And then you get to observe the set of symbols that were transmitted at each time. And we want to recover the set of transmitted code bits. So this is what we call it the unsourced multiple access problem because now we don't really care about who transmitted what. We only care about which set of code words were transmitted. And it turns out that the typical metric we are interested in is the per user error probability. So what we want to say is this. The decoder is tasked with producing a list of code words that were transmitted. And you say that I'm willing to accept the probability with which an actual transmitted code word is not in the list to be some epsilon. Now, I know that some of you may have a interest in this epsilon being zero, but I think all of these is of interest. You know, Sometimes you may want this epsilon to be really small. Sometimes you don't care about this epsilon being somewhat big. I think, I think all these regimes are of interest. Um, all right. So what I described so far is the error-free model, right? So in this case, you get to observe exactly what was transmitted, perhaps with multiplicity or without multiplicity. But it's also possible, oops, I think this is a mistake. This should be an, uh, that, that should be an erasure there. So sometimes it's possible that the symbols are erased completely. You have interference and then you lose those symbols. It's also possible that you get a list of symbols which are more than the list of transmitted symbols. So for example, you may have errors. It's also possible that some things are flipped. Many kinds of error models are, are, are possible. In particular, it's also possible that you get soft decisions, which means you might get the probability with which a particular symbol was transmitted at time i or not. Okay, all these things are possible. And all right, so recently there has been interest in trying to find some kinds of bounds. So one information theoretic result that's relevant is to say that uh, to compute an upper bound on the er error probability, given the number of users, the size of the field, the length of the code, and the rate of the code. I think this was more or less, they looked at random codes over FQ, and then I think they computed some information theoretic bounds, and this is available. And so here are some questions I'm interested in. First of all, I want to know, is this exactly the same setup in a typical list recoverable code? More or less, at least, is the noiseless version right out of the bat solved? Do we know everything we need to know about this? That's the first question. Second question, for a given epsilon, can we characterize, or, or for a given set of parameters, for a given length, number of users, size of the field, and epsilon, can we characterize the rate or somehow see whether we can do better than this bound? So the, they more or less analyzed a random code, and they came up with some upper bounds. There is no reason to believe there is any optimality to this, to this, uh, to the to the random code. So can we beat this? Um, so this is like an achievability. Thing. That's an achievability bound. Uh, in, in, yeah, that's an achievability bound. We may be able to beat this. Um, thirdly, as an engineer, I'm interested in things that have low complexity. I'm interested in things that have complexity that scale somewhat nicely with k, the number of users. And finally, I'm interested in seeing if there are versions of the quarter variety type algorithms where you may be able to take soft information into account when how, in somehow doing the list decoding. I think these are some of the questions I thought were interesting. There is recently one result that I have seen where they, people have tried to use list recoverable codes more or less in the same setup. Um, and they provide some empirical comparisons to other things that people have done. And indeed, it seems like they are helpful. Um, and uh, we can talk more about that later. So how much time do I have? A couple of minutes. 
Okay, so I, I want to say one more thing. I mean, this may be very obvious to some people who have worked in this field before, but I feel like this version of the multiple access problem is more or less isomorphic to a compressed sensing problem, one to one. And, and there is something I, I feel like we can learn from both of these. So clearly, if you think about this problem of saying, you know, I have K users each wanting to transmit B bits of information. So one way to think about this problem is to say, you, uh, let me think of a, a vector of dimension two raised to B. And each one of these B bits gets mapped to an index between one and two to the B. And so what I end up transmitting is actually this index vector multiplied by a sensing matrix. And what I get to observe is that plus noise. So anytime I can solve this problem, I've essentially solved this problem. And if I want to solve this problem, I could try to solve this problem first and, and, and try to uh, get a solution for this. But the problem is that typically we're interested in B being, you know, even if B is 100, we're talking about incredibly large dimensions in the compressed sensing problem. So it's kind of naive to think that you can solve the compressed sensing problem as it is by throwing standard solvers at the compressed sensing problem. So what you really want to do is to use some structured sensing matrix, which lets you reduce the complexity. And I would like it to be polynomial in K, the number of um, active users or the number of non-zero indices in this. Um, and, and one of the things that we have tried is this is something that may resonate well with many of you is, is um, to do a kind of a divide and conquer strategy. So one thing to do is to say, let me take my B bits of information. Let me add some redundancy to this. So I'm going to encode it strictly over the binary field. And then what I will do is I will split this vector into smaller chunks. And then I use a compressed sensing algorithm to be able to convey the index that corresponds to each one of these smaller chunks. So now we have k users, each one of them sending these smaller chunks. So essentially what you then get is back to this list recoverability problem. So I have these n slots, and I know the set of symbols that were transmitted in each one of them, and I need to stitch them together somehow. I have to do the list recoverability, and what we used in this case are these parity bits to stitch these pieces together. So we call this as a tree code. So what you do is you, you put some parity bits in here, which are all linear combinations of the bits that are that that appear before that particular block. Now, what that lets you do is it lets you build a tree and then prune the tree with the ones that don't satisfy the parity check. You can prune them and you can throw them out. This has a case quiet complexity. It turns out to perform reasonably well, but by no means the best you can do. And I perhaps there are constructions of list recoverable codes that can do better than this. And I'm I'm, I'm interested in learning more about this. Question while the next speaker says something. Yes. One comment that for uh, compressed sensing, we know how to do decoding in linear time the number of rows of the matrix, which can be exponentially smaller than the number of cars that you are concerned about. Oh, what kind of constructions are these? There are a few that are almost optimal as well, or actually optimal. So there are some linear time ones for forming matrices, and you could also construct matrices like based on expander graphs and other stuff. Can you use simple tricks like bit masking, bit masking? And there are also more complicated ones, but even if you want close to linear, it's, it's, it's not hard. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, I would be curious to see that because they might be able to port that onto the, ma the multiple access problem, more or less. Sorry, does it give one uh, complexity linear in the number of signals instead of the matrix size? Linear in the number of rows. Yeah, the number oh, of rows. So to the sparsity of the yeah, yeah, I think the number of rows will be roughly k log n, right? K is the number of users and n is the dimension of the matrix. So it might be roughly k log n and that would that would be good enough. Maybe we can take the, the further oh. discussion offline. I think you've uh, successfully learned tonight how the audience would have done. Thanks so much. All right, and next up we have uh, Ken Brown from Duke who will uh, tell us about something on the board. So 
while it's setting up, I should also say how, how are the constants in these linear time are they? Uh, actually, it's really good. Okay. Yeah, I think the Fourier one said that they couldn't get up. They have like four Yeah, Okay, uh, I'm Ken Brown. Uh, <laughs> I'm from Duke. I do not, I have a few theorems. I don't usually try to solve theorems. Uh, the main reason I'm here is I'd like people in this audience to solve theorems for me. So let me talk about problems. <laughs> so, um, you know, if we have this simple idea of an encoder and a channel, and a decoder. Um, this is the, the basically the idea we use when we think about making these quantum error correcting codes. So the only thing that changes is the encoder is now two codes somehow put together. And then at the end, we can measure the code and decode. But uh, as someone who builds quantum error correcting codes in the laboratory, the laboratory is very far from this because the encoder doesn't work, the decoder doesn't work, <laughs> and then normally this channel is too long, so you do some kind of quantum error correction in the middle. And when you do this quantum error correction in the middle, um, you know, this key idea is that you measure these syndromes and you don't actually get access directly to the data. So you don't actually learn anything about the state, and uh, from the last uh, session, right, I only learn, you know, I want to be in this black cube, but I'm in one of these red cubes. So the only information I learn is which of these red cubes I'm in, and then I fix it. So when you think about, um, uh, yeah, so let's just, let's just think about how this works. So if I have the surface code, uh, it has, you know, starts off with bad parameters, <laughs> no rate, uh, but it's worse because the way we make the encoder is actually the same as this quantum error correcting channel. So we measure the syndromes squared of n times. And so when we think about the, uh, so we think about the uh, quantum circuit. This quantum circuit we implement So we often talk um, in quantum, fault tolerant quantum error correction of this space-time volume. So for these topological codes, this space-time volume is d squared times d. And then I want to say that lately in the field, there's been a lot of good work on, um, uh, yeah, like really recently, space-time codes, cloquet codes, which kind of slightly break the coding picture, um, different types of cluster states. Um, all right, so the, all right, so that's, okay, I'll take a question here. It, hopefully this makes sense from Ani's talk and the other talks on error correction. Good, everyone's happy. Uh, why do you have D on C axis? Uh, because I can't trust any of these syndrome measurements. So each layer, each layer gives me a syndrome, but this syndrome is wrong. And so I repeat some number of times. And for this code, typically you repeat D times. And then you're able to um, run a decoder that runs over this whole space-time block to figure out what went wrong. Yeah, anything else? So the vertical axis is time, and then, then the measuring D times is so that you're now have D level, you know, P fault tolerance, right? Because the syndrome yes. has the same error probability as the flips or something like that. Yes, that's right. So, so th this model assumes 
errors happen with the same probability any errors. But yeah, the basically, um, in this kind of model, the geometric distance is the distance. So the space distance is d to get from one boundary to the other. And then the time distance is d because you need that many times to distinguish between something like if you had a measurement that failed d over two times in the same spot, your syndrome is way off. So you have to kind of get to d over two plus one to see it. So it's well known that um, service codes correct a constant fraction of errors. They have a positive threshold. Yeah. Like, even though D's only D. Is, is it possible they still have a constant threshold with syndrome errors, even if you did do like three levels? Like, maybe that has not to be D for a constant fraction threshold. Okay, so that's a great point. So, so there are other codes um, which have this property sometimes called single shot. Um, which promises that you don't have to go to D errors for your code. It's possible to do less errors. Um, but it's also true that for local, for spatially local checks of the surface code, that, that doesn't exist for the surface code. More questions? All right, so now um, for something different. Uh, yeah, no one, right. no one has talked about measurement-based quantum computing. So there is a direct map from this to something which is d to the 3 half qubits. And this thing is called a cluster state. And in this cluster state, each layer looks a lot like this. But now time is really space. And the process of um, moving information, transforming information, is just measuring up through this cluster state. Um, and there's been a lot of work on this, which is called foliated. There are also some cool not cluster states called non-foliated, where there's not exactly a code, which connects back to this Floquet codes, where there's not exactly a code. And that leads to the thing I want to talk about, which is I can write down these circuits, right? So I basically just have a bunch of qubits. Um, I have a bunch of unitary gates. And then I have some measurements here and there. And these objects, this, this kind of general space-time code could describe either of these objects as fine. Um, but when I think about these errors, as we learned in the last talk, the key error that we always use is we take some number of qubits and we replace it with the identity on that block. And that identity block, we, we, we normally assume that it acts on the support of the gates in the circuit. Now, we can always decompose this um, depolarizing channel. as the application of some m qubit poly operator um, onto the circuit. And so what's, what I'm interested in, so okay, so, so right now, most of the time when we do this work to make fault tolerant quantum computation, we assume there's a code. We get this code by assuming there's a channel. <laughs> but our channel actually comes from, most of the errors in the channel comes from creating the code and looking for syndromes. So, it, so the, the, our choice of this is what makes the channel. And so uh, uh, I guess I was inspired um, uh, by the tutorials on Tuesday 
which to me, this is kind of like a weird insertion deletion problem. So you have a function, like a, you, you have a function, which is evaluating this quantum circuit. And the, yeah, circuit, circuit. The circuit is just a list of gates. And the noise is basically inserting unwanted gates. So this is just an insertion problem, right? So I'm just inserting unwanted gates. But I want the output to be the same as long as the number of inserted gates is less than my whatever distance, my distance in my circuit. So what, yes, what I'm very interested in is trying to think if we can build our fault tolerant circuits this way without having to think about code channels. Channels, channels built for codes. So we know, like, <laughs> it turns out channels built for codes will solve this problem. But it'd be nice if we had, um, in the same way we can think about, you know, class theory corrected codes that are made for insertion deletion. Can we think about fault tolerant quantum circuits that are made for insertion deletion? That's, it. That's my thing I want people looking at. More questions? Any questions? Yeah. Wait, so then does more tangibly, does this abstraction mean that the code needs to be designed around the circuit instead? Is that kind of what you're getting at? Because the the the, the reason why it feels incongruent to me between insertion and deletion is um, you can shift gates, right? Yes. And that's actually okay in a circuit. Yes. Right. So it, it's 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 not immediate that it goes back to the binary binary um, like that over the field case, right? Because in that case, you're literally like shifting indices, and those objects are, are different, right? Yeah. So 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 that's a great way to think about it. So um, so if I think about the surface code, I can correct um, you know up to whatever d over two uh, weight weight d over two polyhedras, right? This whole mechanism here, the reason why I have to measure d times is to guarantee that this output surface isn't clean, but that the output surface has errors that are less than this. Um, so that's, so, so, so it's this sort of weird thing where uh, I can push all the errors following my fault tolerant procedures out to the end, which then defines my channel. And there's kind of, um, I don't know how to say it. It's like, like this interactive loop, right? So I picked this surface code because, oh, I have poly errors on a channel, on my memory channel. But then I can't encode it, and I can't decode it. I have to do this like layer of thing. And then I'm like, oh, man, this is only going to work if the errors come out at the end at d over 2. And so I use that to construct this circuit. And then why did I bother with the surface code at the bottom? What really matters is this circuit. And this is starting to show up in these space-time codes and floquet codes and these non foley cluster states. But these, these codes have still mostly kind of followed from the examples that we have of these topological codes. Is that? Wait, OK, let me rephrase it, what Wait, I've heard. So that you're saying, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Yes. Uh, let's say again. So next up, we have uh, uh, Han Wen Yao. Do um, you have slides? Yes. I'll just hold it. <laughs> Do you want to use this thing if you want it? Thank you. Okay. So I'll quick. Uh, uh, I'll take this chance. Thank you, Mary, for holding this be talk. I'll take this chance to give a quick introduction to our recent work with uh, Wally, Christian, Alex, and Henry. 
Oh, uh, I'm Han Wen, Han Wen Yao from Duke. About uh, this work is about uh, how uh, we managed to improve the BP decoding performance of quantum audio PC codes. Okay, so I'll fly over the setup for um, the syndrome decoding problem on quantum uh, audio PC code really quick because like uh, there are many quantum sessions introducing the like the CSS code and the stabilizer setup already. So. Um, here we will be looking at uh, the decoding problem of CSS code and the error model. Uh, I'll look at the like the the basic like a really simplest error model well, where we only have like a bit flip error, independent bit flip error with probability p x, and uh, because CSS code the uh, the stabilizer that correct the bit flip error are separate from stabilizer that, that correct the phase flip error. So basically, correcting x error is the same as correcting z error. So I'll focus on the just the x error here for this talk. And uh, the, the syndrome decoding problem is that um, given a syndrome, which is the which is the product of the, the error vector with the, the stabilizer matrix HZ, uh, the decoder would like to find um, an error uh, with this syndrome that maximizes the conditional probability. Okay, but the problem with quantum RDPC code, uh, but the problem with quantum CSS code is that um, it has code degeneracy. So uh, CSS codes fall into the category of stabilizer code, where the code space is defined by the uh, by the space that uh, is unchanged under the stabilizer operators. So, if we find any error, uh, any correct error plus a stabilizer as our decoding result, uh, this decoding is still successful, because when we try to recover the space, uh, we will first apply. Uh, EX, try to move it back to the original code space, and then apply a stabilizer because the stabilizer doesn't change the, the qubits, doesn't change the original code space. So if we invert this operation uh, to apply like a, an error correction plus a stabilizer, uh, this is still a, a correct decoding answer for this problem. So this is called code degeneracy. And uh, you would think that this is pretty good because this, this means when we try to do the syndrome, uh, when we try to uh, solve the syndrome decoding problem, there are many, many correct answers. Like all the answers differed by stabilizers are essentially equivalent. But however, this will pose a problem when we try to apply the BP decoding. Because unlike classical case, uh, there's only one correct answer. But in the quantum audio PC case, there are many correct answers uh, up to difference of the stabilizers. So, believe propagation decoding is a message, message passing algorithm on a telegraph, and uh, it was originally designed uh, in, uh, to. Uh, it has excellent performance for the classical RDPC code. Uh, however, uh, when Poly and Tron, uh, so Poly and Tron uh, in 2028 uh, are the first uh, work that try to apply to the quantum signal decoding problem. However, when people try to apply BP to quantum, it doesn't work as well because of code degeneracy. So basically, there are many different correct answers that both can attract the uh, can attract the BP decoding process. That makes it very hard to converge. Okay, so after Poly and Tron's first uh, effort to apply BP to quantum, there are many works that try to improve the BP decoding performance. And um, uh, spoiler alert: at the end, I'll show a curve compare with BPOSD and BPSI with our algorithm. So uh, we propose to use BP guided decimation to decode quantum audio PC codes. So BPGD was earlier introduced um, to solve the constraint satisfaction problem and later applied to the lossy compression problem, where the setup is there are many uh, where where the setup is there are many correct answer and it suffice to just find one of them. And uh, 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 the BPGD algorithm that we're going to use here uh, works as follows. So we're going to run many rounds of BP. And after each round, after running BP in each round for T iterations, we will, uh, if, the, if, if the BP algorithm hasn't converged, meaning we haven't find an error that matches the syndrome, we will pick the most reliable bit nodes based on the BP soft information and fix its value, fix its value to either 0 or 1 based on this bias. And then we go into the next round, and we run BP for another T iterations. We fix another bit, and we keep going like this until either uh, BP finds a convergent error, which matches the syndrome, 
or we have fixed all the bits in the telegraph and we still haven't found the correct answer. So this is uh, how BBGD works. And the idea is that the BBGD basically, uh, uh, and the in intuition we have behind this algorithm applying to quantum is it approximate a sampling process because by running BP for sufficient number of iterations, the start information we get for each, for a single bit node, for example, approximate the log likelihood ratio of the, the sum of the probabilities of the cohorts uh, where we have a, a the, the correct answers where we have a zero at this location versus the sum of the probabilities of the correct answers where we have one in this location. So um, by fixing this uh, bit node to either zero or one, we basically throw away half of the space and we narrow, uh, narrow, down, uh, narrow down our search space. Okay, so the curve is here. Here we present our simulation curves compared with both BP showing in the blue curve, BPOSD in red, and another work in 2022 by Kresma and Selvin, um, which proposed to improve BP with stabilizing activation. I'm going to sk skip their method, but uh, here you can show all the comparison here. We, we run it for two different codes, the B1 code and the C2 code uh, constructed in the Pantaleev and Kalachev's paper in 2019. The B1 is a um, generalized hyperproduct construction, and C2 follows a hyperproduct construction. And uh, the performance is pretty good. That's the punchline of this talk. <laughs> that would be it. Does the variant of BP that you use here make a difference? Sorry? Does the variant of BP that you use here make a difference? We just use some product. Uh, the basic some product algorithm, uh, like a I, I haven't tried like other, there, there are many variants of BP, including mean sum or like a normalized BP, for example, but I haven't tried those. I just run the most basic sum product algorithm and the performance is already pretty impressive. So I'm happy about it. <laughs> Let's thank the speaker again. short break for technology and erasing. Next up we have, uh, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Next up we have uh, Jason Pollock, um, who will tell us about something on the board. Yeah, good. Hi, I'm Jason, I'm from Syracuse. Um, good, so I wanna build on what the picture Chinmay gave earlier today about error correction. Um, where the idea is we've got some space and quantum states of a physical system. This is a bad marker to choose. We've got some space of quantum states of a physical system. H, Hilbert space. And um, the physical system encodes a logical subspace, um, which is a subspace of the physical Hilbert space. And then I have some error channel, which takes me to a different point in the Hilbert space. And this is a good code if the canola form conditions are met. So um, this doesn't actually affect where I am in the logical Hilbert space. There exists a recovery channel such that the composition of the error channel and the recovery channel takes me back to the same state. Okay, so I want to consider the generalization, which goes by the name of operator algebra quantum error correction, where the idea is essentially that I have a restriction on the type of recovery that I'm allowed to do. I'm only allowed to apply some restricted set of operations in the physical Hilbert space. And so intuitively what you might think is that, okay, uh, this means that I can't reconstruct the full state in the logical Hilbert space, but I can re reconstruct some portion of it. But if you remember what Chinmay pointed out is that 
Um, logical states, logical code words are locally indistinguishable. So the sense in which I can reconstruct a portion of the information is not just, oh, I take some portion of the qubits in the logical Hilbert space. It's something more subtle. So I need to tell you how to define that. And in order to do that, we need to think about not just the space of states, but the space of operators, linear operators acting on the space of states. Um, and so this goes by the name of von Neumann algebra. So um, what I'm going to use von Neumann algebra to do is I'm going to um, define something called the algebraic state, which uh, tells me about um, what information I can recover from a state if I have access to a specific set of observations I can make. And then I will use that to define um, the key notions in operator algebra error correction, which are the notion of privacy and correctability of a von Neumann algebra with respect to a channel. And then hopefully I'll have time to tell you about um, some results, um, which we know in particular special cases of channels. Okay, so um, let me define a von Neumann algebra. Is this marker okay? Should I use a different marker? Maybe you get a different one. Maybe we should just throw away. Yeah, yeah, don't put it back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, uh, a von Neumann algebra M is a subset of the space of operators on some Hilbert space um, such that um, all operators in the von Neumann algebra have the following property. So um, if O is in M, then if there's two O's in M, then there sum is an M, so it's an additive group. Their product is an M, so it's a multiplicative group. The adjoint, or dagger, is an M. Um, and then finally, and this is the key, thank you. This is like my class, too. Um, always have this problem. Okay, the key defining extra feature here, which separates this from just a standard algebra, is that um, every scalar multiple of the identity, um, C times I, the identity element in the group, is an M. Okay, um, so in general, for our infinite Dimensional Hilbert spaces, this is a quite complicated object, but for a finite dimensional Hilbert space, the space of linear operators is just the space of matrices. So this is just some algebra of matrices that contains the identity. Um, a simple way to generate this is if I pick some set of self-adjoint matrices, Hermitian matrices, and I form the multiplicative group generated by those things, and then I take the span of that multiplicative group, this automatically gives me a von Neumann algebra. So I first use the multiplicative properties, and then I use the additive properties. Um, OK, so if I have a von Neumann algebra M, I can also define the commutant of M, which is denoted by this prime, which is the space of operators um, that commute with every element in the von Neumann algebra. And then I can form the center, which is the intersection of M and M prime. So that's the space of operators in M, which commute with all other elements in M. So the identity, all of the identity, um, multiples of the identity always lives in the center. But very importantly, sometimes you can also have additional elements in the center, which don't look like the identity. And when that's the case, there's some non-trivial symmetry, which is preserved by all of the operations in the von Neumann algebra. That's what having some non-identity element of the center means. Um, good. So there's sort of two key facts about von Neumann algebras, which make them useful. So the first is the bicommutant theorem, which I believe von Neumann realized, which is just this statement. The commutant of the commutant gives you the algebra itself. 
this is where this assumption four was important because um, otherwise uh, I might get all of the identity multiples even if they weren't originally in M and this would not be true. Essentially because of this statement, you can prove a classification theorem about uh, von Neumann algebras which says that um, I can always decompose a von Neumann algebra into pieces such that each individual piece only has identity elements in its center. So the symmetry lives in the individual blocks and each individual block itself just looks like um, something with no extra symmetries. Um, so this is known as the Vetterburn decomposition theorem. Um, the statement is for any von Neumann algebra um, acting on a finite dimensional Hilbert space, then I can decompose the Hilbert space into pieces, these H alphas and H betas, um, such that I can write any element of M as a block diagonal matrix in this decomposition. Okay, and in particular, this immediately tells you that for any state in the Hilbert space, um, there exists what's known as the algebraic state in M, such that the expectation value of O measured in state psi is equal to the expectation value of O in the algebraic state for all O in the subalgebra. So this is precisely the object we wanted. This is the thing which tells us about all of the information that you get for measuring um, elements of M and nothing else. Okay, um, and in particular, I have a state, I can also define an entropy, an algebraic entropy, um, which essentially in each of these blocks, I have a matrix. And so there's a piece which comes from the Shannon entropy across the different blocks. And then there's a piece which comes from the von Neumann entropy within the individual blocks. Okay, so using von Neumann algebras um, in the 2010s, there was this theory of operator algebra error correction developed. And the key concepts are privacy and correctability. Um, so writing these down precisely requires a little more channel technology than we've probably seen. So I'll just say this verbally. Um, so let's think of the setup um, where that I drew here. Um, I've got an error channel. It's acting on the physical space of states. Um, and that then has some implication for how things move around in the logical subspace. So the idea is if I have some subalgebra of the operators in the logical subspace, I think it's correctable with respect to the channel if I can recover from the error. So again, I can't recover the state fully, but I can recover the logical state rho m. On the other hand, um, a subalgebra is private with respect to the error if when I look at the effect on the state, it just acts as a member of the commuton of M, and so it commutes with a logical state. So something is correctable if I can use it to change to um, any other operator in the logical Hilbert space. Something is private if I can't use it to affect the algebraic state at all. Um, and it was realized sort of immediately in these papers that um, there is a relation between privacy and correctability. Essentially, um, if M is correctable for a channel, then there is a dual channel for which it is private. So there's an important special case here, which I think uh, is easier to get some intuition for. So this is the case that was just talked about a few speed talks ago, which is the erasure channel. Uh, so in the case of the erasure channel, well, the idea is that my Hilbert space divides into two pieces, A and B. And I want to be able to reconstruct the logical state only from the A degrees of freedom or from the B degrees of freedom. So say I have correctability with respect to um, erasing B. That means that um, there is some 
operator, which acts only on HA, such that its effect on the logical Hilbert space is to get me any operator in HL. So let me let me write that down. For all O in M, there exists some OA, which is in HA, which acts on HA, such that um, OL is equal to the projection of OA times the identity in B. onto um, the logical Hilbert space. So I'm being a little vague what I mean by the projection onto the logical Hilbert space, but essentially the definition of a code tells you how to find the subspace L, HL inside H by specifying some isometry, which is like some function of the coordinates in the larger Hilbert space I can get to get the smaller one. And so if I know that isometry, I can project operators onto it. Okay, and then similarly, privacy means that for all OA in L of HA, um, this projection commutes with every operator in um, HL. Okay, so now the physics shows up, um, and it shows up because of the bicommutant theorem. Um, there is a very strong constraint, which is placed on codes um, that allow me to recover information both from A and from B. So this is known as complementary recovery. And the idea is basically this physical picture here where I imagine that my um, physical Hilbert space is a circle here divided into two pieces A and B. And then the logical Hilbert space lives in the interior of this circle and it breaks up into two pieces, which are M and M prime. So um, this, a code that has this properties is a code which knows about the division of the physical Hilbert space into these two pieces in the sense that this piece contains all of the information in M and this piece contains all of the information in the commutant of M. And both contain the information in the center because the center is the intersection of those two things. Um, okay, so because of the bicommutant theorem, you can convert statements about um, privacy and correctability on M into statements about correctability and privacy on M prime. And so you get a very stringent result, uh, which we proved a few years ago, uh, which is essentially there's two possibilities. So possibility one is if I take the set of all operators in A times the identity, and I project that onto uh, HL. Um, this could be a von Neumann algebra. If it is a von Neumann algebra, then it is the unique von Neumann algebra for which the code exhibits complementary coverage. However, it could also fail to be a von Neumann algebra because in particular, like it could fail to be closed under multiplication or to contain the identity element or something like this. And when that happens, there is no von Neumann algebra for which complementary uh, recovery occurs. Um, just one or two more minutes? Yes, good. I want to say like one more thing. <laughs> um, okay, so one more thing follows from the classification theorem, which remember I told you in addition to an algebraic state, I could define an algebraic entropy. It was shown by Harlow and collaborators um, a few years ago that um, if I have a code exhibiting complementary recovery for a bipartition, um, that is equivalent to saying for every state in the logical Hilbert space, there's some operator which is in the center of the code, uh, sorry, in the center of the von Neumann algebra, such that the difference between the entanglement entropy of the physical state across this bipartition 
is equal to the algebraic entropy of the code, of the, the algebraic entropy of the state in the code, plus the expectation value of this operator. Um, so this is relating a entanglement entropy to the sum, the entanglement entropy of a physical state to the entropy of a code state plus the expectation value of an operator. And the motivation for this was results in ADS-CFT holography, where there's a similar statement where the, the entropy in the bulk, sorry, the entropy in the boundary is equal to the bulk entropy plus the expectation value of an area operator. So in this sense, the idea is that this L, this is an operator. It's an operator that's in the center. It's an operator that's in the center, which doesn't look like the identity. So this is telling you something about um, this code has some symmetries. And in particular, it has the symmetries which you would expect for a code that has geometrical structure. And now you can divide it into pieces like this. So um, let me just close by saying, I think a very interesting question to ask is, what if I uh, relax away from um, erasure errors? So all of these notions of privacy and correctability go through perfectly well for general channels. Um, it would be very interesting if there is a result like this result of Harlow, which tells you something more general in these cases. And if it's true, I would love to know it and what it actually says. Stop there. Maybe one quick question. I'll, I'll mention there's a duality theory <laughs> for codes in, on classical quantum channels by Joseph Renes which if, if what you're saying is true, is probably a very special case of that. Yeah. But in that case, it's worked out in a fair bit of generality. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I think, right. The hard part here is um, going to the erasure channel saved me from having to define this notion of um, a dual channel, because in this case, it was sort of obvious that the dual of erasing one half of the Hilbert space is erasing the other half of the Hilbert space. Uh, the hard part is to define a dual in general, I have to sort of lift to a larger space of states um, in, in the standard way that you can re relate channels acting on a Hilbert space to unitaries acting on like a, a product Hilbert space or something like that. And so like, again, the privacy and correctability result exists. It's not immediately obvious to me that you could do all of these, these um, like this is sort of the hard detailed theorem. The rest sort of follows immediately from proofs of fine Neumann algebra. Yes, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but I think there's a special case yeah. of this worked out in, in some detail. Great, we should chat about that. All right, well, let's uh, thank the speaker again. And let's thank all of the speakers uh, in this speed talk session. Thanks, everybody. And uh, so that concludes the programming for today.